Thank you very much. And uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for venturing out um, into this, this amazing uh, weather and coming to this, this panel. But um, hopefully, um, well, I can see the topic of the panel and the, and the lineup we have on the panel is incentive enough to overcome come this rain. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, cybersecurity for the many is, is obviously an important topic, one of the uh, pressing topics uh, today. It suggests that our cyber tools, policies, and laws should protect people in societies. It suggests that the many should not be subject to mass surveillance or exploitation of personal <laughs> or private data. Um, for me, I think it also implies that the few or anybody shouldn't um, also be able to hide their own abuse, abuses of power. Um, and so even though these are very broad and, and simple questions, uh, they, uh, observations, they do lead to more interesting uh, questions, such as what protections should whistleblowers have? Um, what protections should hackers have? What, what role do hackers play um, in, in the pursuit of, of righting wrongs and, and fighting abuses of power? Um, what does cybersecurity mean in, in practical terms? And there are many more questions that um, we're hoping to explore today on this panel. Um, so I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled to be, to be here uh, with Lori Love, Mustafa al uh Dr. Richard uh, Tynan, and uh, Naomi Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi Coleman. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I know I'm not the first to do that. I'm always uh, traumatized by uh, the story of uh, Cyprus and Greece doing this. And, uh, when it's, fine. Flying, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. We can just, we can just yeah. get past it. <laughs> Thank you for being so forgiving. Um, so, uh, Lori Love uh, was accused of hacking into U.S. government websites. In February, a high court ruling blocked the extradition of Lori to the U.S. and the ruling set a precedent for hacking suspects in the UK. So that is a big, uh, um, Mustafa al Bassam is a PhD researcher at the Information Security Research Group at University College London, focusing on scaling blockchains, and he is an advisor to... Oh, it's meeting out. Oh, that's fine. Is <laughs> that okay? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Okay, and he is an advisor to Secure Trading and Cognosec. In 2016, he was listed by Forbes as one of the 30 of the 30 in the technology section. At the age of 16, he was co-founder of LulzSec, a high-profile hacking group which made headlines for his hacks of Sony, Fox, and the FBI. His work has been cited in Vice, BBC, The Washington Post, uh, and many others. Um, Dr. Richard Tenen is a penetration tester, ethical hacker, uh, and an ethical hacker for cybersecurity for a cybersecurity consultancy. He has a PhD in AI and a diploma in law. He was the lead of technology at Privacy International for five years and a penetration tester at The Guardian for, for one year. Naomi Colvin is a uh, whistleblower advocate and a uh, columnist for New Internationalist. Um, <laughs> so, um, we are very excited. The format of this um, discussion is we're just going to um, pose some, some uh, general questions to start and the, the panels will take a crack at, at uh, giving their insights uh, into answers of, answers of these questions and um, we'll, we'll proceed from there and um, we'll open it up to the audience uh, to, to engage in further discussion as, as we move along. So probably the, the most general question to, to start is um, what <coughs> does cyber security uh, for the many mean? Um, any of our panelists want to take, take this up? Uh, I guess uh, I can start. Um, so I mean, um, what do you think about the title of this panel, Cyber Security for the, man, for the Many? Sorry. I would kind of like to take that further and say let's have cyber security for all, for everyone. Yeah. Sure. So, so what does cybersecurity for everybody means? That that means everyone deserves cybersecurity, even the bad guys, even the terrorists, even the criminals. Because the problem is that if you start going around saying 
certain people don't deserve security or they don't deserve end-to-end -end encryption, then you're weakening, weakening the security for everyone. So the, so the NSA in the US, or the, the National Security Agency, and the DCHQ in the UK, which is like the UK's, the UK's version of the NSA, um, they have these huge teams that do nothing but find security vulnerabilities in software that everyone uses every day. So the NSA has this group called Tailored Access Operations uh, that consists of many hackers that they've hired that simply all they do is try to find ways to hack into software that we all use, whether it be Windows or Firefox or Chrome or your, or your, your Apple device. And the reason they do this is because they want to be able to hack into people that they consider to be, well, what they say, bad people, or to conduct political espionage operations. And so they're sitting on, on these cyber weapons, as some people call it, that, that they could use to target everyone in this room. So then the question becomes is, well, could, could, could this, could, do we trust our governments to have access to this kind of information and this kind of power? Is that, what, is that really what cybersecurity means? Is that cybersecurity really mean a few people are being able to hack everyone and everyone else just uh, trusting, trusting people? But cybersecurity doesn't mean trusting someone to, for security. So cybersecurity means security by design. The software that you're using should be secure by design, not that you trust the government that you want, that you want to be hacked. Because um, I don't know if you've all heard about the, the, the WannaCry ransomware uh, that made headlines last year. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, the WannaCry ransomware was a, was a, was a virus that infected um, many companies all around the world, including the NHS in the, in the UK. And as a result, um, many NHS hospitals and trusts were out of operation for a few days, potentially causing lives to be lost. And the, 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 the cyber weapon, as some people call it, or the, the computer exploit that was used in this ransomware was actually developed by the NSA and it was leaked uh, from the NSA because they were so arrogant to think that they could, they could keep their um, cyber weapons arsenal private because they, apparently they're so secure that nothing gets leaked from the NSA. And so it turns out that they were sitting on this cyber weapon for 20 years that could, well not for 20 years, for about, for about 10 years, that could hack almost pretty much any version of Windows that was released, that was released for the past 20 years. And of course it was leaked. And then, and, now, and then it was used in ransomware that could potentially have costed lives, or probably did cost lives because it was used to infect the NHS. So when we talk about cybersecurity for the many, that means, that means everyone deserves cybersecurity, and that doesn't mean we should concentrate the power, uh, concentrate, uh, that doesn't mean we should trust the government or not, not to hack us. And if we find security vulnerabilities in things, everyone, it should be fixed for everyone, not just for, for the elite or, the, or for the few. I think I can uh, follow up on what you said said <clears throat> with the political uh, statement of they're interested in, in cyber security. There's two actual versions of this. One is cyberspace security, and the other is cyber security, all one word. The first one seems to mean using cyber or electronics for traditional national security things. And that seems to be what, what Mustafa was talking about there. The second one is what we all, up here at least, think cybersecurity is, and that making sure that our information is secure. So when you hear politicians or people talk about their, their uh, focus on cybersecurity, I think you should ask yourself the question, which version do they mean? The one that keeps us vulnerable, insecure as some might say, but allows them to conduct their, their operations, their espionage operations, uh, or do they actually mean what we all think it means, which is they're going to keep us safe? And the second thing I think is that cybersecurity is no longer either version, is no longer just about cyber and information. We saw with the NHS, hacking into a driverless car can kill people, hacking into planes can kill people, medical devices, pacemakers, these kind of things. So the, 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 the landscape of this debate, it might be quite narrow in terms of it's focusing on vulnerabilities in tech and things like that. <coughs> but the impact of it is growing literally by the day as financial systems are built on these systems that can break down medical devices, literally everything is going to be built on these foundations that unfortunately, if they're not built securely because 
the government doesn't have an interest in seeing them secure, the consequences can be very high. Yeah, um, just to add to that, um, Richie made this um, satire jo uh, post, uh, GCHQ uh, job posting, where he defines, um, he thinks that GCHQ's definition of privacy means uh, a private space for you and your government to interact with each other. <laughs> um, right, so loath as I am not to jump in the pylon against governments and spooks, because they are terrible. Um, <laughs> and they do need to change what they're doing a lot. Um, but to just broaden the idea of what is cybersecurity um, so that we get a more general understanding. And it's unfortunately all encompassing. So my most general definition of cybersecurity is not, any children, not fucking up. <laughs> um, and having bad things happen to you as a result of information and technology and the way these things have um, intricated and woven themselves into our lives very rapidly in, in the space of a generation. Um, I can still remember when the internet didn't dictate what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis and my money was, you know, kept written on a number somewhere. It was in a computer, but, you know, it wasn't at risk of uh, turning into a smaller number um, randomly. Um, nowadays, technology is everything. Uh, information is everything. Your life um, is no longer your collection of possessions and your house, but it's... Uh, entries about you in databases, um, credit scores, uh, bank balances, um, and massive, massive dossiers of information that are collected daily about you by uh, private corporations such as Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon, Yahoo. And we've seen in the last uh, year or so that um, there are more kinds of cyber insecurity than just getting hacked. That was the traditional threat. You have a nice uh, castle somewhere and it's got nice things in it and someone comes over the ramparts and steals all your nice things. Um, in the last year, we've seen a different kind of cyber insecurity and that is much more pernicious. And that's the, um, the threat to our very democratic franchise and our ability to act as citizens in a world um, because we no longer can have the same degree of trust in our sources of information. We can no longer be certain that the people we are interacting with online are real and not um, puppeteers uh, controlling trolls and bots and um, we're at risk of being manipulated more than we've ever been by um, uh, adverts, by um, cunningly placed news stories in our sources of information, our feeds which are controlled by unaccountable algorithms. Um, some little gnomes in an office in Facebook could decide that um, people are a bit angry in Peterborough and there'll be no, there'll be no angry Facebook on Peterborough, everyone will get happy, happy unicorns and rainbows and um, you know, this, this has been seriously proposed to stop riots. And if you can stop a riot by changing what people think about, you can start a riot by changing what people think about. So um, we, we have run headfirst into a world where information and the way it's controlled and who has control over it um, will determine every facet of our lives and we need to start meaningfully asserting control over our personal information and um, we need to start meaningfully coming to a better accommodation with the tech giants that um, currently have more power than any feudal lord or aristocrat ever had over our lives um, and uh, they are now, they have more muscle than government so government is afraid to even tax Amazon and Google, they kind of get their way. Um, and if we don't correct this soon, we, we're going to enter into a neo-feudal world of technological serfdom. Um, so it's all doom and gloom, um, but <laughs> the good news is um, we, we are emerging into literacy. So the, the reason that hacking is uh, glamorized and um, you know, my name is splashed all over the newspapers for allegedly hacking some US government computers is because it's mysterious and we don't quite understand this new world that we're in. Um, in the same way that witchcraft was, um, you know, glamorised because people didn't understand how disease works and how sanitation works, and they assume that the people that collect the herbs, you know, are the ones that you need to burn on the stake. And Mustafa and I have uh, not not quite been burnt on the stake, but we've had experiences of um, because of our supposed skills and talents being, you know, feared and revered in equal measure. And then we need to move past this te technological mystique into a period of general technological literacy so that you understand how you're transacting. Every time you get on your computer and use your internet browser, you are paying for these nice shiny things with bits of information that are used to sell you things at best. 
that can also be used to uh, psychologically manipulate you to vote for um, a horrible orange fascist loon or to vote against your interests uh, in a constitutional mistake, arguably. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, we need to start educating ourselves and each other so that we are we have agency and autonomy and we're interacting with this informational economy and this informational world uh, in a way that isn't giving up our, our rights. So that's what cybersecurity is. I think Lowry is right that we're sort of at an inflection point where this sort of mystique that has always existed around the concept, of, around the idea of hacking and what hackers do, and that we're at an inflection point where people are beginning to understand actually what the landscape looks like. There's a reason why every other week we seem to hear about massive data breaches and people's personal information leaking, leaking you know, on, onto the open internet. And that's because everything online is terminally insecure. It's not that there's a few flaws here and there that very clever people can find. It's like there's they're massive, massive, huge distributed problems. Um, and we need the expertise of people like the people who are on, you know, on this panel to help solve that. Unfortunately, the position of many governments, including the, including the British government, is that um, the, the only valid, so, so the only people who are really supposed to be looking at and tackling this massive distributed problem are, are people who work for the government or, dif or diff different bits of the government or have been through government approved cor courses. Um, this seems to me to be quite a, a, a stupid thing. I'm not sure it really makes sense to look for a centralised solution to a massively distributed problem. Insofar as security researchers and hackers are revealing um, obscured information, so, so you know potential data breaches, and bringing it forward for the public good to benefit everyone, hackers are whistleblowers too, right? And we should be protecting them. We need to change the stupid situation that pertains today, where people who are acting for the public good to try and solve this massive problem of online insecurity are. Um, they're liable for prosecution under the Computer Misuse Act for doing so. In cases, I mean, I think we're on the, our way to sorting this out, but in cases like Lowry's um, being targeted for extradition and extraordinary public punishment in the United States, I'm concerned that as the threat of extradition is lowering, we're passing actually worse laws in the UK, that you can now, there's a <coughs> new clause of the Computer Misuse Act, which unlike, you know, which has like American style Sentence, sentences like 14 years to life. Um, if we are to have cyber security for the many and not just GCHQ, we need to think seriously about the role that, ha that independent security researchers, hackers who are not affiliated to the government, have to play, and we need to treat them as whistleblowers, protect them under the sort of whistleblower protection kind of laws, and certainly make sure they're not um, exposed to the threat of prosecution for doing the right thing. Yeah, I mean, just to add, add to Naomi's point that cybersecurity is like more of a decentralized thing. It's not like some centralized thing that we we trust the government to keep everyone secure. Now, if a lot of these vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure, they're not found by the government or or by the National Cybersecurity Center. They're found they're found by hobbyists or by researchers at cybersecurity companies, and they have no association with the government. And um, and if, if um, Recall how I mentioned the WannaCry ransomware uh, that was going around last year, or uh, two years ago. Um, that was actually stopped by um, a young man in England called, called Marcus um, Hutchins. And all, all the while, the, the security arm of the government, National, National Cybersecurity Centre, was, was giving out press releases advising businesses how to uh, tackle this, this ransomware. It was actually stopped by... Um, some uh, a, a young man who lives at his parents' um, a house um, in England, and he he wrote a blog post about how he, how he did it. And the National Cybersecurity Centre actually um, asked him if they could copy his blog post to put them on on the government's blog, and he and he accepted. And then this 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 young this this young man um, decided to go to the US for a hacker conference called DEFCON, and just before he was, he was leaving the US, he was actually arrested by the FBI. Because he was suspected to 
be involved in the in these um, like creating a piece of malware when he was like 16 or 17. And so, and, and apparently the UK, the, the UK government actually um, knew, knew this, that they, he was going to be arrested before he even left, left the UK to go to the US. And, they, and we all know, as we've seen in Laurie's case, why you wouldn't want to be extradited to the US to face charges, because there, is, there pretty much is no justice system in the US when it comes to computer, computer hacking. So we've, we've ended up in a situation where the, the government has literally uh, took, taken credit for this young man's work or used or used it, or and people have used it to, to, the benefit, to their benefit to to stop this ransomware that was was infecting hospitals, and they pretty much threw him under a bus by letting him, letting him go to the U.S. under the knowledge he was going to be arrested for for things that he was alleged to do when he was a teenager. And just so people are under no illusion, um, before I do uh, a penetration test or an ethical hack, I have to get authorized scope, which says what I can touch and what I can't touch. If I go outside it, there are big problems. And to give you an example, I'm not going to mention his name, but you can look him up online uh, based on the, the fact he doesn't usually like to be associated with this. But a few years ago, uh, a guy found a problem with the website of Oxfam as he was donating money. He notified them of the problem. Rather than say, thank you very much, and maybe say, you know, here's a point or something, uh, they called the police. The police arrested him. And he lost his job at HSBC Bank on a fairly decent salary, fairly decent job, because he was convicted and fined. Guy donates, spots something, and this is, I think, back to the, the notion of techies being whistleblowers in terms of the information they find, but also in terms of the security that they find. And the unfortunate thing is that to find problems, you've got to do, you basically got to act like bad people, or like the bad people do, and you've got to put the system through its paces and cause the harm, or, or Hopefully, you're not causing as much harm as a, as a genuine attacker would. Well, it's not really harm. It's, 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 like, yeah, it's, it's not computer access. Online. It's not computers online. Yeah, true. So it's not. It's mm -hmm. not like you're. It, but you're still accessing the data. You technically breached some law. But if you were doing it for a good purpose, you didn't go and, and breach everybody's medical record or download everybody's donation to Oxfam for the previous 20 years. <coughs> and it also meant that if a, a legitimate hacker had discovered this, and they probably would have, because it was so bloody simple. Uh, they could have gone in and caused Oxfam to have a massive fine for a data breach from the ICO, uh, which would be even more now under the GDPR rules. So it's, it's ironically in a lot of companies, a lot of individuals' um, interests to have people with skills to be able to do this and to not be punished and to be treated in a way uh, that doesn't even risk uh, prosecution, losing your job, fine, extradition to the United States. So we're not up here talking about hyperbola or, or irrational hypotheticals. This is what actually happens and has been happening for quite a while. Yeah, I was just going to add just a, a note about um, Marcus Hutchins, about his case. Marcus Hutchins, it's been over a year since he was arrested and he's still stuck in the United States. The case against him almost collapsed a few, a few months ago in response to which um, the prosecutors laid down a whole other set of charges against him. If you are unlucky enough to be indicted in the United States and find yourself there, it's, I mean, you've kind of lost already. It's such a terrible punitive system in which you're at such a poor position as a defendant. Um, things aren't quite that bad here, but as Richie says, we do have, the, but the structure of the law is similar, and as Richie said, we do have the precedent of people being prosecuted with quite dramatic real life consequences purely for trying to, do, for trying to do the right thing. And the threat of that happening to other people is a significant chilling effect which stops people, behave, people behaving in the way that we, we, would, we would like them to and to um, try, and sort, try and sort out cyber security, for, try and, you know, assure some kind of assurance of security for all of us. So it's something that really needs to be sorted out. Just to sort of illustrate this, um, <laughs> The, the, the sheer extent to which things are broken online. So the problem with, um, say if you build a bridge and you didn't get it right, it, it, it kind of falls down or it sags or it wobbles, you know, and it's kind of obvious that it's, that it's got a flaw in some way or it isn't and then it breaks down the line. But with software, um, it's very easy to achieve functionality. Um, that's, that's actually the easy thing, getting it to do what you want it to do. It's getting it to not do any of the infinite possible things you might not want it to do. And... Um, 
So we call this technical debt. So you kind of build a complex system and then um, you maybe have a bit of turnover in staff and the person that made it that complex doesn't exist anymore, doesn't answer their emails, isn't on the other end of the phone, and other people are just kind of maintaining it and patching things and stopping the leaks. And then before you know it, this is a kind of Frankenstein's monster that um, can be literally bewitched by, by, by people such as ourselves, by sort of waving our hands and whispering the same the magic incantations. Um, um, and so this is so widespread, it's, um, it's like putting out fires. You kind of, you spend, if you're an internet security hobbyist, you kind of spend all day, you go on this showdown, it's like a search engine for things on the internet, and you find things and then you sort of, you, you kind of groan in, in despair or laugh or both kind of alternatingly. Um, but there's so much fire. It's like there, there is a wildfire and we're all volunteers trying to stamp out bit to bit to stop it, you know, taking out the whole forest. And more often than not, until maybe the last five years, um, your, um, your reward for stamping out that bit of fire would be a letter or an email or a phone call or, or a legal threat. And um, this happened to me more times than I could count in the 90s when I was just a young child. I'd find something, I'd, you know, make it my... Um, make it mine, and um, and then I try and contact the administrators and say, look, this, you know, I should not be sitting here on the top of your big pile of, of gold. Um, you know, what could, do, you want, do you want me to explain how I did it? And then instead, they just pulled the plug, and I didn't have internet for six months because the you know BT banned me from using the modems or whatever. But um, in in the last few years, we've got a bit better at this. So, but it's on a voluntary basis. So companies can start bug bounty programs where they say. Go nuts, go nuts, you know, poke this, prod that, turn that over, stroke that, and, and as long as you don't destroy anything too much, then if you give us the information as a tip, and it's useful to us, well, then we'll reimburse you. <laughs> but, um, I don't know if we can wait for everyone to do this voluntarily, because we, we kind of need to make a collective decision under the, the rule of law to say, um, if you're reporting something because you genuinely, as a public, as a civic-minded uh, citizen, you don't want it to get abused by someone. You know, if it's your bank and you find a security problem in your bank, it's in your interest to get it fixed because your money lives there. Um, we need to have the same kind of protections that people have in the legal system for reporting crimes and malfeasance. In fact, sorry, I don't want to say the same because we don't even have decent protections for people reporting crime and whistleblowing. But we need to have, uh, we need to aspire to a standard where nobody thinks it's not worth their interest putting something right, because um, there, there's a lot of things to be put right, so um, it's, it's something to bring up with lawmakers, and they're, they're a bit slow on the uptake, really, and so we're still left with this 80s, um, scare them straight kind of attitude, where, um, like in my case, you know, they, they think they've caught a hacker, and they'll try and lock them up for 99 years to, you know, encourage uh, everybody else not to test these things, that, that's not going to work, there's 2 billion people that live in... Um, uh, legal regimes that even the USA can um, extradite from and they will be testing and there's people that are protected by nation states and they will be testing security so we can't scare people away from hacking we, we want to encourage them to do it the right way um, and that's something to bring up with your neighbor too. I want to question I just want to ask you a general question maybe you'll bring it back around um, so to some of the areas that you're discussing as well but the data breaches seem to be getting bigger and bigger. The abuses of power of people's personal and private data seem to be getting bigger and bigger. And you know, I'm wondering to what extent can this system be saved? Some people say we're in a critical point within the next 10, 10 years. It's crucial to to fix this system. Um, and you know, I'm wondering is that a possibility or is it just something that is broken and a new type of system needs to replace it? Yeah, just to answer that question and add to all of these points as well, um, with regards to data breaches, um, so as Chris said, um, when I was a teenager, I co-founded this hacking group called Lulfic, and uh, Lulfic was, was a group that existed um, in the summer of 2011 for about 50 days, and we made a lot of headlines for hacking a lot of governmental organizations <laughs> and corporations in the US and in the UK. And uh, one of the reasons that we started this group is because like we realized, like we 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 came up, we um came across so many different vulnerabilities in major websites, and to, to us it was kind of shocking to an extent. But it was also the case that these companies, we felt like these companies didn't really care that these vulnerabilities existed in their websites. Like if we emailed them and said, "Hey, I have a vulnerability," in most cases they would they wouldn't care, or they would threaten us with a lawsuit. 
Um, and and like and it seemed to us like the, the only way to, to actually show people that to, that their information is insecure was to actually hack into all of these websites to demonstrate publicly in a very public way uh, that 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 these companies are insecure and actually make it a PR disaster for these companies because what what we found is that it's often the case that a lot of these companies they only actually care about security when it be, when it becomes a PR disaster for them. And so for um, a, a good example of this is Sony, right? So during our 50-day hacking spree, we hacked Sony seven times. Um, it, was, it was kind of like, a, it was like Sony had so many security issues in, the, in, in all of the websites that it was kind of like, like the game of the year among hackers. It was like, let's see who can hack Sony the most. And I think Sony was hacked like 30 times in like two months, in, a, in like a single two month period. And, and interestingly, just like when this started happening was and, and, and after um, when the PSN hack happened, that was just after Sony had laid off the entire uh, a lot of the security team to cut to, to cut costs because they didn't think security was a big issue for them. <laughs> and um, so we we hacked into all sorts of companies and Sony, um, Fox, um, FBI affiliates, Pentagon, um, Nintendo. Like it's a it's a it's too many to to list, but. Um, when we hacked into all of these companies, like, like it wasn't really a testament to how how master hackers we were or how good of hackers we were. It was more of a testament to how poor the security was, because like the way that we hacked into all of these websites was through some very basic techniques. Like SQL injection is a is a is a is a technique that people have known about for two decades, and yet all of these major companies and governments are still vulnerable to it. And so, like for example, the way that we hacked. The Arizona Police Department was because one of the police officers used the password one two, three, one two three four five. Like a lot of this is low hanging fruit. Like a lot of this, like if you just fixed a lot of this low hanging fruit, um, then we could probably el eliminate like ninety nine percent of data breaches. But because these companies don't really see it as an issue, at least on a, on a high level perspective, because as as Bori was saying, like when you're when you're building a, a product or a, or application. You, you, from, from a managerial perspective, you only kind of really care about the, f the functionality that you can see, not the functionality that you can't see. So, like, if you're a manager and you're telling your programmers to code this, to code this website, you're, you're, the, 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 the kind of criteria that you're going to judge, judge them by is how quickly they, they deliver those features. You're not going to judge them by like how secure it is or how how well the code is, because you can't see that. You can't actually see that. Just to add to that, and I think we should probably open up this for question soon, but just to follow on from what Mustafa says, I mean, M Mustafa's describing an environment in which the attitudes to people's data is incredibly casual, and I just want to, we, I think we've, be we've become aware just how important our personal data is, and what Mustafa is describing, this incredibly casual attitude to protecting people's data, this doesn't matter, I mean, what does it matter, but we know it matters a lot, and this is what we've been learning through about like, the Cambridge Analytica stuff that actually the impact of having matters of personal data around, actually do, it does have a massive, massive impact and it can even be used to sort of potentially subvert political processes and ultimately this is why we really need to care about this issue and we need to um, make sure that the, you know, the, the, the skill sets that can help ameliorate this very serious problem that we you know, treat these people properly and give them the value they deserve. Um, I think the, it's a, probably a good thing to insult your audience, but I think one of the problems is the public and us demanding security or actually seeing security as an issue and seeing it in the broadest terms as Larry and everybody up here has, has stated. Um, but I think the data breaches that we've seen are the tip of the iceberg because this is happening on such a large scale across so many companies and they've been allowed to amass. Uh, so much data and so much um, intelligence about us. But to put the kind of, or one of the examples or, or analogies that I try to give people uh, about the problem is imagine you went into a Biden car and you looked inside and there were safety features, seat belts, whatever. And rather than actually be allowed to go up and test the seat belt, give it a little tug to make sure it's not tissue paper, you're told, don't touch it, trust it. 
Don't even check that it's tissue paper. Don't check whether it'll fall apart in your hands. Just trust us. Yet, you're the one who's going to suffer all the problems when you smash into a wall and go through the windscreen because it's not proper. So, the demand for people, A, to be able to test their systems, whether it's individually, everybody in here wants to have a play, or whether it's certain <coughs> individuals who have skills who are able to do it, that demand has to come from everybody. So the, the, the title of the, the talk is Cybersecurity for the Masses. The masses have to actually want security in the first place. And to be able to want it, you have to look at the, the, what the companies are doing and demand information about whether they're secure with your data, if they're, if they're not giving strong guarantees about security with your data, they possibly don't give it to them. So a lot of these things, and, and you don't want to turn it into a situation, I hate when people say, oh, don't use Facebook or something like that. Absolutely not. Use Facebook. Have 50 accounts. When you've got somebody who's watching everything you do, make them see everything. Make them see a whole lot of stuff, and you can hide what you're actually doing mm -hmm. in all the Facebook accounts, in all the, the, the Twitter accounts. Have as many SIM cards as you want. Tech is fun. When we were growing up in the in the 90s, we were playing with everything. We were looking at what was happening with, with mobile phones. So don't see things as, it's I, I can't lie to the internet, or I must tell the absolute truth or the best version of myself to Facebook, because they know it's a lie. Based on your analytics, where you check in, where you've been, what, or what websites you go to, they know that all the happy, nice things that you put on your, your profile is irrelevant, because it's done by you. They're only interested in the real you, which is the real you you, you can't keep secret for, for a prolonged period of time. And it comes out and emerges from the kind of big data sets that we see which is not necessarily the data that you actually give over because they don't care about that. They want to see where your locations are. Where do, you, where do you go on a daily basis? Do you stop outside particular shops? Or whatever else you're doing online so that they can find out the real use so that they can do whatever they want. And those are the kind of data sets, not necessarily the, the emails and things like that, that have been slowly amassing. And so it's not just about the protection of data, your data, that you voluntarily give over, but what's kind of called metadata the data about data that is more revealing about you than most other things. Um, so yeah, it, I think it has to start with everybody in this room, and it has to start with the public demanding it from them. Uh, I was just going to add to that. I mean, I think what we were coming to there is um, we have to look at this as a massive um, this example of game theory, which is unfortunately a term that's been diluted in the last couple of years by idiot commentators from America, but um, e everything we do is based on an incentive structure, and currently the incentive structure for the people that are custodians of your data that can uh, affect your life is not really to, um, to, to store it securely, it's not necessarily even to inform you when it's been breached, um, and it's not currently to work with um, hobbyists or independent security researchers to ensure that there isn't any compromise. And then we, we're kind of being naive on the internet. The, the, I don't know if this is a culturally insensitive analogy, but we, we kind of treat the internet the way that um, indigenous peoples in, in America treated the, um, the Europeans that came over with mice blankets and shiny things, and then um, they didn't realize what they were exchanging and what they were selling away because they didn't have a notion that land this is, this is a simplified version, but they didn't really have a notion that you could sell land, you know, like they, they, they were kind of swindled out of it. And this is what's happening with our private data, is that we, we think we're getting a free service, we think that we are, um, that out of the goodness of their hearts, Twitter allows us to, you know, um, micro-blog about our lives, and Facebook allows us to interact with all our friends. We, we're not the user, we, we are um, the product of these networks, and the, the, the user, the customer, is the advertisers, and um, the exchange is information about your lives going to these people so that they can put the right adverts or whatever in front of you to make you spend your money on the things they want you to. And then um, I think like there's a there's an old phrase caveat emptor, which is you know um, beware, let the buyer beware. And then um, you know if you um, somebody offered you some gold back in um, the the gold rush days in America. In Alaska, um, you wouldn't just give the money for it, you'd maybe like, put it in your mouth and bite it, see if it's malleable, you know, look at it closely, see if it's got the right luster. And um, we need to maybe have caveat data or caveat computer or whatever, caveat net network or, um, so that we, we are actually informed and, um, and we consent 
there's no such thing as uninformed consent. And every time you click accept on a terms of service that would take you literally a week to read. I think they did a, an artistic project where someone read Facebook's terms of service. And I think you can watch the entire 10 hour video if you really want to die or you're tweaking on meth or something. But um, that, that, that is not informed consent. And if you went into a hospital and they, you know, they said, just click this and you're like, what are you going to do to me? Click yes, and then, and then they rearrange your internal organs. That would be seen as problematic. And so we, we need to assert our rights to, to interact with these big network services in a way that we're not, not being exploited. And then, yeah, so we need to change, change the um, incentive structure so that we get a better system. Thank you very much. Thanks all our time. We're going to open up for questions um, now. Just wondering, do we have a rubbing mic? No. Great. So. Um, maybe we'll take three questions at a time and then uh, give the panelists an opportunity to respond and then another round. And um, because there are a lot of people here in time and we want to get the most from our speakers, can we be restricted to one question each and no statements, please, just questions? There's two in the, in the back uh, on the... Hi, um, I've been telling a few of my friends recently that um, you know there was a story a little while back about people being microchipped, you know, to enter buildings and things like that, and they were all shock horror about being microchipped. I said, yeah, but hang on a minute, you're carrying around a mobile phone where you are essentially microchipped because everything you do on the internet on your phone, you're being logged. I was just wondering what you feel about that. Oh, don't take three questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps the panel can um, give us an idea of some simple things we could do to actually protect ourselves. Uh, automatic cookie wiping, uh, using proxy systems or something like that. Can you uh, tell us how useful GDPR is in terms of um, increasing cyber security? So yeah, um, yeah, we probably should have mentioned that earlier, the phone thing. Um, um, yeah, I mean, compared to, you know, having a barcode written on your on your arm or something like that, or a microchip that has a unique number, um, the thing we all carry around with us is infinitely, immeasurably worse. If you went to uh, 1950s, 1960s East Germany and you spoke to a high up uh, member of the Stasi and you said to them, imagine, imagine a future where everyone carries around a device that tracks their location, that has a microphone that is always on for their convenience, um, and um, people can access all of their photos and they're continuously uploading this information to effectively partners of the government. Um, they would be like, this is amazing, how, how, how can we have this? And then you tell them that we, we would all do it voluntarily and it was not forced on us. Um, you know, they, they'd probably just be beggar their belief. And then um, this is another one of these things where um, shiny, shiny, shiny objects um, and, and nice functionality has meant that we've, we've given up a lot. and. Um, it's very hard to turn off the spy features in our phones. Um, Google, if you have an Android phone, you can turn the satellite off and you can say, don't track my location. And Google, <laughs> Google, out of the goodness of their heart and sticking to their motto of do no evil, they will track your location anyway through any means available to them. And so any, um, yeah, so it's really scary. You can actually go home and you can get your entire location history from Google. Um, which is a nice thing they do to scare us, I think. Um, and um, yeah, you can just follow yourself on a little map. Um, so this is this is really bad. Um, we kind of maybe need to, and this is again saying um, we don't need to accept um, all of the compromises that we get for the nice things. And um, some of the bargains we have made recently have been Faustian. You know, we have traded away uh, some short-term convenience for some long-term insecurity. And then to, to the second question, what can we do to increase our security just as uh, users of the internet. Um, so there was a good suggestion there. You, you don't need to carry, like a lot of this tracking is voluntary um, in the sense that uh, websites give you a little string and you carry that around with you and then they know when you come back. So it's almost like every time you went into a shop, you know, you have these weird shopkeepers saying, oh yeah, oh, he looked at the suit. And then they put a little sticker on you says light suits. And then when you go into Debenhams, they're like, oh, let me show you the suits. 
you can just take those off and that's so that's in your browser you can delete the cookies and um, the general the sensible advice now is not to have one browser that you do everything with because um it's putting all of the keys of the castle in one place so if you're doing casual browsing uh, use a different instance of a browser a different profile or a different container if you're doing serious banking or work email keep that separate as well and you can install extensions Richard will be able to tell you more. There's lots of privacy enhancing extensions, such as deleting these cookies. Um, use a better browser. You don't need to, to uh, sorry, not browser, search engine. You don't need to ask Google. You can um, um, use DuckDuckGo, which is a lot more privacy friendly. Um, consider using proxies and consider using the Tor browser. You don't need to be an international drug lord or a terrorist to use Tor. Um, or a journalist or someone working for the CIA or the State Department um, who funded it and keep it going. Um, you just need to be a person that wants to help other people be more anonymous. So the more people that are using this network, the safer it is for everyone because um, you have an anonymity set, which is all the people that look kind of like you. And so the people that are um, uh, in uh, autocratic regimes doing journalistic work, they are safer because you're using Tor to look at kittens on the internet. So consider consider using these technologies um, and finding out more about them. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so to, to answer the first question, um, to as to what we were saying about, I, I think the correct way to look at personal phones is as an extension of yourself. Like, don't look at a phone isn't simply a, like it's not like your butler. Like that, that they have a separate relationship with your phone. I think your, your phone is like an extension of yourself because if you have access to your phone, you effectively have access to your thoughts. And I think what Richie was saying uh, with the analogy that you wouldn't just click accept it to click click yes yes accept in a hospital to some to someone wanting to to rearrange your organs. Like I think that's a very apt analogy because um, if your phone is an extension to yourself and you you simply um, say yes to every single thing or let apps leak all your information, then that is almost like rearranging your, your internal organs or agreeing, agreeing to, rearrange, to rearrange your internal organs if you see the phone as an extension to yourself. Uh, but to, to go to the second question about uh, what can you do, um, I, think, I think one thing you could do, one simple thing that you could do is simply install ad, um, ad blocking um, software or add-on. Um, on your on your on your browser, uh, these these things like um, block all of these tracking scripts on your when you when you access um, the New York Times for example, Washington Post, um, they often load what 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 is called these tracking scripts uh, by from third party advertisers, which basically send your unique identifier to lots of third party um, advertising services, where then they crunch all of that data and do big data to, to figure out your interests and stuff like that. So if you install ad blocking, ad blocking software, then that blocks um, all of the trackers, or we're supposed to. But uh, when I was checking in, and to, and to tie this into the third question about GDPR, um, I was recently checking into a flight um, <laughs> in on British Airways, and if it, I couldn't look, I, I couldn't for some reason my browser wouldn't let me check into the flight. Like it, it the page just wasn't, the page just wasn't loading. And I discovered that was because I had my ad blocking software on. So I turned off my ad blocking software and I was I tried to figure out why is why am I not being allowed to check in without turning my ad blocker off. So it, and it turns out that every time you check in to British Airways, it leaks your entire booking information, like your 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 full name or your surname and your booking reference to like fifty different third parties, like Twitter, Google, LinkedIn, Facebook. Like I could actually see this in my browser. Like my, it's, my browser is literally making requests to Twitter and Google and LinkedIn and Facebook with my booking reference and my name in the, in, in, in the request itself. And I thought this, this was ridiculous. Like why, why would British Airways suspend my booking details every time I check, check in? So like I, I made the GDPR complaint. Um, well, not, well, not a complaint. I sent a letter to, the, to British Airways because um, you have to give them 30 days to respond first before you make a complaint. <laughs> Just tell them why are you, why are you doing this all of this stuff? It's, this is clearly a, a violation of the GDPR because the GDPR actually requires you to explicitly ask for consent, explicit consent, when you want to send data to third parties for advertising purposes, and that's explicit consent, not just blanket consent. 
like like those tech boxes that you see at the, at the bottom of login form or at the top of the website, like accept or cookie, do you want to accept cookies or do you, do you agree to our terms and conditions, that doesn't count as consent according to GDPR. You have to have, a, have, a, you have, to have an explicit message on the website that says, do you want us to send your data to third parties for advertising purposes? Not just do you agree to our terms and conditions. Um, so like if you go to Tumblr, for example, and you sign up, there's actually like 300 different checkboxes that you have, to, you have to accept. That's, that's, how, that's how explicit and fine-grained it needs to be. And there has to be a way to opt out. And clearly, clearly there wasn't. So um, I sent them a complaint about this. And they responded like last week, like exactly 30 days after I sent, in, uh, sent the um, complaint. Like this, that's the deadline when you have to respond. Like exactly 30 days. And I can tell the letter was clearly very carefully worded because it was titled final letter but PDF, clearly, clearly it has, has had a few drafts. Um, but uh, like it turns out, anyway, so I read, I read the letter and I actually, they completely, they completely didn't take responsibility for anything and the answers where they gave was completely ridiculous from a technical perspective. Uh, so I'm definitely gonna make a complaint to the ICO. But the interesting thing was, um, when I actually went back to their website, they had actually removed all of these tracking scripts. So, so So, so they reviewed all these tracking scripts, but they didn't admit to any liability or responsibility in their complaint. And I don't think that's good enough. They have to admit that they were they messed up and they should actually compensate customers for that. <laughs> and I think that uh, nicely uh, ties in with Naomi's point of whistleblower. When you reveal information, the sunlight washes away all that nastiness that once people can see what's going on. And I think that's from a GDPR perspective to answer the third question. Uh, there's, I think there's two impacts of GDPR. One is on everybody, and it's basically going, what the hell are these 300 checkboxes for? I didn't realize when I went to website one, I was actually indirectly going to website one to 299. Um, from an, a company's perspective, I think, and this is not in relation to any of my past companies that I've worked with, this is just a broad across, across the board, um, they're also going, well, now we've got to find where the data is. And they're going, why the hell do we have all this data? Why, why do we have it in so many different places, so many different systems using different versions of them? And then uh, there was a, a pub chain, um, uh, Weatherspoons, who just said, we don't want it, we're just going to delete it all. Because it's so toxic, or at least it, it is toxic if GDPR kicks in and whatever the fines are. Five Possibly because they sold it to Brexiteers for illegal campaign violations. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so I think GDPR has, has, has kind of taken us to where data protection law thought it was taking us in the 1980s. Um, and so I'd say on, on that, we're just at the 1980s in terms of where the data protection act should be. In terms of the other two questions, in terms of uh, the tracking, um, you forget that, that we've got a face on show, which is a permanent thing that can be tracked everywhere we go. And we can't, we can't change our face but we can't change our phone, get a new phone with new tracking and various things like that. So, so it's not just about the tech that's overt and that we keep on ourselves. And the other question about um, what tools can we use, the general advice um, that I usually give is don't focus on the tech. Um, information security is about information. Data security is about where that information is, is, is uh, represented as data. And then system security is where that data is stored or processed and things like that. No amount of tools will help you if you're using them wrong. So you can download all the best tools under the sun. Entire operating systems have been built for anonymity, for privacy, for security. But if you log into Facebook on Tor, they know it's you. So they will, it'll, it'll have, they'll have less information in terms of uh, metadata about you and it might be harder for them to do. But I would say, if you're gonna use a tool, try not to familiarize yourself with what it does but try and familiarize yourself with what it won't protect you against. Because tools can, they definitely have their place. I mean, we all, when, when you're trying to, 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 to break a decision, there's tools that are preventing you from getting in, and they do their job. Only if somebody who knows how to deploy them has put them there. And it's the same for individuals, I would say. Focus on the information. A, where is it? Because if you don't know where it is, you can't deploy a tool to protect yourself. And if you're using, because uh, uh, some tools are kind of hard to use, 
So you're better off using tools to protect information that you uh, see of A of value or B can have serious consequences to you. So it might not be a good idea to protect the, your, 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 your recipes that you've got online with the same set of tools or the same technology as, say, uh, personal banking information or your deepest, darkest secrets. So putting your deepest, darkest secrets into Evernote and then sending them up to the cloud in the clear so any Evernote employee can read them might not be such a good idea. So Evernote is not the right tool for that. So I'd say, look at the information. A, see where it is, and you might surprise yourself where it is, as long as the USB stick that you might have lost, how many USB sticks is it on? And then once you see the information, go online and see what tools you can use to protect that information, rather than, maybe, but there are some basic ones like VPN, Tor, and things like that. Did you want to ask the question about the ad blocker? So, which ones, uh, the gentleman here's got a follow up. Which ad blockers did you, I think it was in stuff like that was um, ads, just yeah. So just to make this quick, Ad, Adblock Edge is the one that used to be Adblock Plus. They got um, taken over by people that changed their business model, so certain adverts get through. So Adblock Edge, uh, UBlock Origin, and Privacy Badger, and, and Ghostery is another one. And they, between them, you should get rid of most of these trackers. Um, we should take more questions really rather than rambling anymore. Yeah, can we have uh, so a lady at the back? This is, the, the, this is the last round of questions, so I'll have to wrap up after this. Um, if you turn off uh, all the cookies on your uh, search engine so that uh, they're, they're, it bounds more, and you then click when you go into a website and it asks you at the bottom if you accept cookies, if you just click on that, what does it override your settings or does it do the settings override that? Just quickly, that, that's just them covering their ass pretty much by getting your consent. So you, you kind of will have to click yes or you'll lose a lot of the site functionality. Um, you should have these extensions in your browser that delete them anyway because even if you've accepted, you're under no obligation to keep these things around. So um, I would generally say accept the cookies on the you know the dialogue that it asks you but then just delete them and I, I have it set up so that whenever I leave the site for more than 10 seconds it deletes it so every time I'm there it's like a new me and that's, that's probably the sense of it. Thank you. Last, you've actually got three minutes so maybe one more minute each you could just, uh, each of you could. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'll guess, um, I'll, I'll just go back to the question that was asked about GDPR. I think it seems kind of clear to me that there are certain, you know, abuse, like openly abusive business models dealing with people's data which you just need to put out of business. Um, GDPR is one tool that can help us do that. There are some problems with GDPR. Um, it doesn't cover everything. It doesn't cover what the police do. It doesn't cover what governments do. Um, and it's also quite difficult to use. I mean, it's also quite difficult to, it's also quite difficult to use. It's not sort of, although you can, you need to read up a bit on, on how to use it. So, but it, it's, it's part of the solution. Another part of the solution is obviously um, lifting the threat of legal jeopardy over security research that we've been talking about. Another one is, prob is probably like unionisation or collective action among technology workers to, to, for mutual support so, so abusive systems aren't built in the first place. I think that's increasingly important and there's been some interesting developments in the United States in reaction to the big technology companies working, working with the US government where tech, where tech workers have started to self-organise and say no we won't do this which is really really interesting. And as Richie said, like another part of this is public awareness and just a demand that you know we don't want we don't want this to happen and to sort of vote with vote with your feet. That's all I wanted to say. So yeah, just work one more tale from the trenches um, regarding kind of silos of data and how um, I don't know if you ever watched reality TV. The, the shows like um, America's Worst Hoarders, or I don't know if you've ever known someone that's a bit of a hoarder. Um, We've got some friends here at the festival that are. Um, um, so one of the US uh, government departments that I was accused of um, hacking as part of the uh, protest uh, that I was accused of being involved in in 2012-13 um, was the Department of Energy. And it's quite interesting because that was quite, quite serious. They had to write a report about what went wrong. And in that report, they said... They said, oh, yeah, no, we totally forgot that we had this 20-year-old database server with every employee that had ever worked for the Department of Energy's private information on there, and we, we kind of forgot that it was there, and it shouldn't have been connected to this old web 
web facing thing that we also didn't maintain for 10 or 20 years. And th this is the Department of Energy, like they run the nuclear, you know, plants and stuff in America. And then, um, so people just accumulate data and there's no cost to keeping it really. If they're already spending a lot of money on servers and computers, the only time there is a cost is when it gets hacked and it's a PR disaster. And the other thing to bear in mind is you don't know about 99% of the hacks because nobody ever tells you. Because even if they find out, they, they're, they're not encouraged to tell people. So we kind of have to have mandatory breach reporting, which would be a good step forward. So that if you, um, if you do get hacked and you lose people's data, then you have to inform them. And then the cost will start to be factored into making these things more secure. And the other thing with trackers and um, that, the great story of Mustafa's with British Airways is um, unfortunately like the... The business model of um, tech companies with regards to your private information is the same business model as gossip mongers and gonorrhea in that they will try and spread it as far as possible in the hopes that they get something back that's just as um, interesting to them. And um, th this needs to be reined in. So we, we kind of need to have, um, um, yeah, we need to kind of get, we, we need to realize that we, we only want to interact with the company that's providing us the service and we don't want to at the same time be having a hundred different people listening in. So um, yeah, we kind of just need to rein that in a bit. Great, well that's a wrap. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists for all the insight and experience. <laughs> <laughs>